I don't believe in free speech. I don't believe in free speech. I can't stand what they teach. I don't believe in free speech. I can't stand what they teach. I can't stand what they preach. I don't believe in free Where was I? I don't know. I got uh, completely Eleanor's lost. Eleanor's class yesterday. Okay, so... You were going to tell me about her class. So this speaker, Mari Rudy, comes in. Oh, yeah. Mari Rudy is is a distinguished professor um, of, like, critical theory, gender sexuality studies. She wrote the—and uh, this book she wrote was called The Ethics of Opting Out, Queer Theories Defiant Subjects. So my fiancé's class yesterday in grad, grad school uh, seminar is a theory seminar. They brought her in um, through Zoom as, like, a um, guest speaker. So, you know, she gets home and she's like, well, I just spent like an hour and a half uh, being lectured to about how women should not get married, especially women. But maybe like people in general should not get married because marriage as an institution serves to control the individual, to tamp them down, to and also to institutionalize them so that it gives you like an institutional approval. Hey, I agree with all of that. Like, I understand that. That's some reason some want to get married <laughs> for those very reasons. I definitely get the point that um, marriage is very problematic in a lot of ways. It absolutely does institutionalize you and give you approval. I, the friends that I have who went straight down the line, they, you know, you get out of, you get, go to college, get a degree in the right amount of time, get a practical degree, go get a job, get married, have kids. Like it's like you, everybody thinks you have your shit together. Everybody treats you like you have it together. You get to feel like you have it together. You get to feel like an adult. You're really living your life now. It's just, you get to bask in the privilege of being institutionally approved. And for people like me who were never on that grid, we were abstract. We were not married. We... We're, we didn't have those kinds of jobs. God forbid we're trying to be like a musician or a writer or something. It's like, who is this guy? God, I wonder if he's ever going to get his shit together and leave town and maybe go get a job and get married or something. You know, I get that. Hmm. And I understand the lack of privilege that you have to suffer by not donning those badges, essentially, which is what it is. You know, it's like, I got my ma- my merit badge today for being married for five years, you know. My female, my my female friend who said that uh, that toxic femininity was just toxic masculinity. You know, she also has has said many times. Um, you know, I I never got married. I don't. I wouldn't want to just be. I've never wanted to just be some man's wife. I think what a sad way to have to see that. Well, of course you not get never got married if that's the only way you can see it. Like in every relationship, no matter how much somebody loved you and tried to be a part of your life, you always saw him as oppressing you and colonizing you well of course you're fucking miserable you know i mean and maybe a lot of those men did do that to you and you should pick better men but of course that's not your fault either the point is like mari rudy can think that and hate marriage and never get married that's fine she can even come into class and we can dedicate the whole grad uh, the whole grad seminar to the top the, uh, the here's the discussion for today only a fucking idiot gets married discuss that's fine, too, as long as next week you can bring in uh, a theologian who's going to argue. Today the topic is only somebody who's married can actually be fulfilled. A woman who does not get married can never really truly be fulfilled and live her true self-actualized existence. Discuss. What pisses me off is that you can do the one and you can't do the other. And what I'm always saying, right, is like you can't do that. You can't have it both ways. You can't allow this person to say this and then not let the other side speak. If it if the scholarship indicates that, um, you know, marriage doesn't make women happy or something, that's really interesting. And you could, as a kind of tongue-in-cheek, engaging way to get your students interested in discussing the research, you could say, hey— Maybe it's better for people not to get married. Let's discuss the research. But ultimately, you should be discussing the research and not actually prescribing how someone should live their life. But, And that's why normally you wouldn't bring a preacher in. But teachers aren't supposed to be preachers either, right? So we don't bring, we don't bring preachers in because we don't want to be preached to. That's not what it means to teach. But if there are professors or teachers guest lecturers coming in who don't really understand what the purpose of a university classroom is, I think it's really problematic. And, and some of those people don't know. 
Eleanor, you know, I mean, she's, she's, she was like, I was, of course, she told me about this and I was like, I'm sitting there, you know, screaming and railing in the kitchen. And she's like, it's cool. Calm down. Like I, I wasn't really actually that upset. And I said, yeah, but you probably should be more upset than you are. And for also, you know, that there's no point in getting upset because you don't matter. And it's true. Like, do you think if she goes in there and says, you know, I felt very unsafe listening to all this crap about queer theory and how I shouldn't get married. I've got an engagement ring on my finger. I mean, but but that's a question, right? Here, here is she is sitting here with an engagement ring on her finger in a class that is that is discussing the fact that you should never get married unless you're just an idiot. Basically, so how is that not supposed to like like couldn't she say, look, I felt personally attacked in that class because this is part of my core identity and you're invalidating it. Well, she's not going to do that. Like Eleanor is not the type to, to come home and, she, you know, and even say to me, much less go to a professor or a department head and say that she felt invalidated. She's not because she's not one of those people. She's not like a woke bully. But but she right. but wouldn't it make as much sense if she did that? As it does when these other people, like if, if next week they brought in somebody who made the opposite argument, the whole class would go right to the dean and say that they felt attacked and assaulted and they needed a safe space. Well, and the thing is, is that um, you're supposed to be challenged. So people who are not married, if they heard a lecture about the benefits of marriage, uh, might feel uncomfortable. That's expected in higher ed, in, in the higher ed institution. That's part of the deal. And if you're getting married and you hear a critique of marriage, same thing. It's expected that you're going to feel uncomfortable and you do some soul searching or you you rethink your assumptions. That that's the deal. So again, yeah, if you if you don't want the married people or the engaged to be married people complaining that their feelings were hurt, then you can't you can't do that um the other way around. So I mean, so I think it's a question of the bigger question is what is the purpose of the university? It is to have, um, you know, civil debate about contested issues and to be exposed to different perspectives that might rattle your cage. And that that's that's the deal that comes with the territory. And you shouldn't have to um, skip class that day or complain that your teacher made you feel unwelcome. You're supposed to be able to expose yourself to those things like uh one, um you know another one of her professors who we discussed last time you know the uh, you know a, a race theory guy um you know he routinely dismissed class he said he said at the beginning of class um just so you know now i will always cancel class when there is a you know race related important event going on on campus you will never be expected to come to class when there's something socially social you know socially important that you should be taking part in out there because there was some sort of a um, a Black Lives Matter event, and he canceled class. And I'm going, okay, if you – here's the thing. If you – I like, no, that doesn't work because – you know why it doesn't work? Because then when the other guy who is like a conservative Christian professor, if there's any of those left, I mean he says, we have a religious speaker coming to campus who's going to – who's a, like, a, like some like anti-abortion religious speaker. He's coming to campus, and – and, no class. I, and I'm going to cancel <laughs> class. I want all of you to go to this and I will give you extra credit for going. And just so you know, I will always cancel class when a pro-life speaker is coming. I mean, that guy would be, if not murdered, he would be out of a job pretty quickly. You know, I mean, but certainly people would be calling for his his firing immediately. There's no way you could get away with that. And that's the thing is that, you know, we can, we just cannot continue. We just can't keep going with this hopeless double standard, you know. They're also not playing fair. They're playing Calvin Ball. Like if you ever read Calvin and Hobbes, they, they, they always play this game Calvin Ball where they go – where they just keep changing the rules throughout the game to privilege whatever's going on with them in that second. So they'll go, you know, hi, I, I tagged you. Calvin will say, I tagged you. And Hobbes will go, no, no, but this is actually the reverse zone where anything you do counts in reverse. And then Calvin goes, oh, well, actually, but that didn't count because you just stepped into the frozen time zone where, you know, <laughs> and they just keep changing. They keep making shit up so that whatever's happening, you just keep winning. And even when you're losing, you just change the rules so that suddenly you're winning. And that's Calvin Ball. And that's what these people are doing constantly. Stop saying that you're battling for equality and equity. You're not. You just want to be the one with the power. You just want to be the ones who are in charge. When anybody says they want it to be fair, what they mean is they want to be the ones who are winning. Yeah. Well, so there's two things, I mean, that I want to say in response. That one is, 
of course, we know it's different to be in a part of the majority culture and then yet find yourself in a situation where that majority culture or assumption is being attacked. You, you, it isn't a reminder of how in all aspects of your life your identity is attacked. So we know it's a little different to be straight and to hear heterosexuality and marriage attack than to be gay and to hear the, you know, a message about that's really anti-gay when you may have heard it growing up in your family, you may have heard it in church, you may have heard it in the public school system, right? So there's, there's still a difference there. And I get that. I don't think we're saying there isn't a difference, but look, if you want, if you want to be able to critique heterosexual marriage, then then you can't go crying foul when somebody critiques something that's sacred to you. You have to be able to put up with it. And a student of mine just recently contacted me and was mad that a discussion, a big discussion was happening with a lot of students and that some people mentioned their religious traditions and um, that you know, maybe that sounded like they were anti-gay because they identified themselves as part of a religion. And, and no one said anything that I would argue was out of bounds. I, you know, And if someone tells me they were raised a fundamentalist Christian, I, I can't say, don't say that, right? I mean, they're, they're allowed to say that if they have free expression rights as students. But the the gay student um, contacted me saying, you know, it's such a pain that I have to put up with this in discussions. I have to listen. And you're not moderating the discussion well enough because you're not telling these people not to say this. And what they're saying is debating my existence. And I kept thinking, well, wait a second. I, I don't remember anybody debating the existence of homosexuality or of any anyone on the LGBTQIA plus spectrum. It was more that it, it was sort of a, um, that this sort of burden the student bears. And I get it. It can be emotionally exhausting. But at the same time, how do we secure the right for people to have debates and it's going to mean that sometimes you're offended, um, whether whether you're offended because they're criticizing heterosexual marriage or you're offended because they're criticizing gay marriage. So how do we, you know, I think how do we square that? There was a and there was a group at Middlebury um, a few years ago, and they created some kind of student manifesto where they basically rationalized deplatforming some speaker. Um, on the grounds that they were um, really being asked to support an event as though all that was happening in the event was a civil debate, when really what was happening was a set of exhausting, stressful, for them it's this emotionally draining thing and they don't want to have to put up with it. It's exhausting and stressful. The point is, though, that this student is saying, like, when someone else discusses something that, you know, that feels threatening to me, like, basically what the student is saying, as a gay student, I don't think people should be allowed to talk about things, even if it's in a discussion, even if it's in the context of this is a discussion, let's, how do we feel about this? You shouldn't even be allowed to do that because it makes me feel threatened. Meanwhile, you know, my fiance goes to a class where, you know, as an engaged woman, she's sitting through an hour-long theory class where the whole class is about how you should only an idiot would get married. And she's not saying, like, this calls into question my existence and triggers me and makes me feel threatened. But, you know, so there's the double standard of how, you know, it's okay to at to attack, I'm doing quotation fingers, her, but not to attack this gay person. Uh, first of all, nobody's attacking anybody, but it's, it's, it has to be okay to discuss one one or the other. You, know, you have to be able to discuss both or neither, rather. Um, so there's that one overstatement of harm, you know, and just the, the hypocrisy of, you know, just having it both ways. We can't talk about things I don't want to talk about. It's like being in a nightmare relationship where, you know, you, they'll, they'll just keep forcing you to talk about everything you don't want to talk about. And you go, well, I'd go like to talk about this. And they say, you have no right to ask me that. Or I'm not going to talk about that. And that, that's the, the thing that has happened now where even to acknowledge – to acknowledge the existence of a different point of view, even, 
even if you're saying I'm not even making this point of view, I'm not even making this argument. Like what happened with you know that thing with um, uh, Lindsay? What was her name? Um, Lindsay Shepard was that her name? The uh, yeah, yeah, right. Well, so she in, Can- in Canada, uh huh. And she showed she just played like something from a debate show. She literally played a clip that had televised, you know. Uh, of a debate about this issue with Jordan Peterson. She's and she deliberately took a neutral stand. I'm not taking a stand, but here's the issue that's on the table. Let's talk about how we feel about this. And so she plays a debate where one person, Jordan Peterson, is making some criticisms of trans politics. And it's you know, and because she simply exposed her students to the fact that some people do disagree. She's not even disagreeing. She's saying, you know, some people disagree, and all of a sudden she's putting trans lives in danger. She's she's this thoughtless, horrible, uh, totally criminally negligent uh, teacher who has, who has made her students unsafe. She gets called in by the administration. They're screaming at her, and of course she has the good sense to have— she's recording this in her pocket, and so all hell breaks loose— where is the outrage on that? You know, I mean, people were outraged, but the thing is, I'm not sure what happened to those people. I mean, were they were they fired? Were were thousands of people coming no. together demanding that they be fired and threatening their lives? Because that's what happens on the other side of the fence, you know. Sometimes. Well, and you know, when I think back, I, and I've been teaching at the university since the late '80s, early 1990s, and I feel like one of the biggest things that happened that has had a series of unintended consequences is this attempt and this ethos to make education relevant and personally relevant for our students. And I feel like somehow that got translated into that everything should feel personally good to the students while they're learning. No one should feel uncomfortable. No one should have to learn anything that uh, or hear about or see anything that opposes their personal values. And I'm like, wait a second. Wait, we, the whole point of creating knowledge is that you're, you're not supposed to have authority based on your identity or the group you belong to or the fact that you were oppressed or the fact that you were an oppressor. That's not supposed to be how we determine what knowledge is true. And so somehow it's like you're not supposed to say anything if you have a particular identity or you belong to a particular group and you can't talk about or a particular topic or you're supposed to listen to the authority of a person because they're a woman or because they're a person of color or because they're, they identify as LGBTQ+. That, and this is just so dangerous because that isn't how knowledge is constructed, right? It, it, it should be uh, whatever knowledge claim someone makes – should um, should adhere to um, specific methods and that it should be uh, found to be true by people without regard to their identity. But we've used identity now as a sort of, and, and the, the personal authority of your experiences and the life you've lived as a sort of way you make knowledge. And we have students coming to classes to have their identity validated. Whereas like, I'm sure your fiance wasn't going to that theory class, hoping that being a heterosexual person about to get married was going to be validated anyway. (laughs) Right. But there are people who are looking for a kind of validation. And so they take these classes and and it's different from like, you know, you go take a class in theoretical physics. There's not like a personal validation you're looking for. Right. But in a lot of these classes that are on topics that have to do with, you know, hot button issues that get debated or sort of that motivate people to go to the polls and vote about things, they're, they're, they're looking for um, something or trying to learn about themselves. But part of me is like, you know what, that's the worst thing we ever did. You should go to college and don't expect to learn about yourself. Expect to learn about uh, topics that are outside of yourself. But people are going to find some kind of validation where um, they have this empowering experience of being right. And I feel like it, you're supposed to recognize everything you don't know. 
and learn how to ask questions and get new answers. But you're not supposed to come in with already knowing everything. Why are you in college then? I, I hope the class a class is useful and meaningful, but it shouldn't be personally validating. That's different. Right. And that's where I feel like it, students are expecting that then, you know, and that's, then you get into a customer is always right kind of approach. And, and then it's just a, a really bad scene. There is this strong current of gender essentialism that's underpinning all of the gender relativism that is being, you know, it's like the, they're out there going like, you know, you know, there's no such thing as gender. Don't we all agree? Am I right, ladies? <laughs> you know, like that doesn't work. <laughs> and it really is like we talked about, we were talking about it before about, you know, like like um, the whole argument, of course, now is like who I am is who is the person inside and the person that I am inside is a completely subjective thing that is up to me and has nothing to do with anything that's actually going on outside of myself. Now, part of this is just the culture of narcissism, right? Where we, we have accepted this sort of weird narcissistic therapeutic, uh, you know, state of existence that we have where essentially just our subjective feelings about ourself are what constitutes the reality of ourself. It's not a bit like in the, in the only important thing is to be, is to be happy and to feel content. And it doesn't matter. And I, like, I've always, this seems like a digression, but I promise I'll come around. It's like, I've always hated this thing where, where people tell their friends that they're perfect just the way they are, or like advertisements, you you know, you are perfect just the way you are like Oprah Winfrey style, right? You know, I want you to know out there, whoever you are, all of you, you're perfect. I love you. And I'm like, that's really, you love the pedophile, you know, you <laughs> love the, the guy who's selling crack to an eight year old right now. Yeah. You love that or, person. Do we, uh, or your employee who doesn't show up to work seven days in a row and expects to still collect the paycheck and, exactly. and get promoted like everyone else. <laughs> the guy who's beating his wife out this. And I feel the same way about like the signs. I could walk out my, my door right now and there's going to be a sign in a yard within three yards. I'll see it. The sign that says in this house, we believe, and it says, you know, everybody's voice counts and it's bullshit. Everybody's voice doesn't count. You don't, and all we, the sort of like equity inclusion thing of all religions and all, no, that's not true. It's all the people that we've decided are right. Those people need to be listened to, but we're still definitely silencing lots of people. You don't want to hear from the skinheads. You don't want to hear from the pedophiles. And I'm not saying, I'm not making the argument that, that, uh, Everybody should necessarily be at the discussion table. I think I think as a society, we actually have to get away from moral relativism a bit and get back to like, no, no, we're going to agree on certain rules that are better than others. You know, we're living in a society here, people. Right. So let's admit that we have rules and boundaries rather than on the one hand, uh, aggressively enforcing them uh, and trying to get certain people fired and canceled because you don't like the values you think they're espousing. Uh, and then at the same time, uh, wear T-shirts and carry signs that say, oh, I listen to everyone and everyone's included. And, you know, they it's certainly if, if they're in, in, interested in inclusion, they're often not particularly interested in the inclusion of a variety of viewpoints. Right. Like they're interested in racial diversity, but not viewpoint diversity. They're interested in sort of gender and sexual diversity, but not viewpoint diversity. So. You know, we do have these very specific boundaries and then aren't willing to admit it, which makes it even more, more annoying and frustrating. What got me going on this essentialism thing uh, was, you know, who you are determines everything about you. Like the personal is the political. Is it just part of this personal is political problem again? So you have, you know, who is that professor who uh, we decided he's not a cool person, so we've canceled him. Like MIT won't let him come. Oh, Dorian Abbott. Yes, um, was canceled for a very prominent lecture at MIT. And it was because he had uh, at some point in the year earlier given some presentation on YouTube that people knew about and that was criticizing the diversity, equity, inclusion efforts in either his specific department or in his whole field because he had some data that showed that women were getting um, way more of the scholarships and and or postdoc opportunities or some kind of opportunities um, that are, you know, that help propel your career. And 
based on the number of them in the pipeline with PhDs, they, they were getting a disproportionate number of them. And so he was like, well, let's, let's admit, you know, we're not, you're not just like making sure you give women a fair share. You're actually discriminating against men and for women. And for that, he was seen as like anti-affirmative action and anti-DEI and, um, you know, bad person. And also someone who would very likely discriminate against his women students, despite the fact that he just presented against discrimination that the women students wouldn't be safe in his classes and they needed to take different professors for their classes. Wow. And, that, yeah. and so that, and that's what happens a lot. Whenever somebody voices an opinion about something, there was a, there was an economics professor a couple of years ago who gave a criticism of women's studies. And you know, next thing you know, there's people saying that they, they, if they're women, they're not safe to take his class. Even though there's no evidence that he ever did grade discrimination based on sex or gender. It, but there's this assumption that if you even think that, or you have a critique of women's studies, you must be flunking your women's students because you're such a misogynist. Yeah, I you're mean, probably a rapist too. I mean, well, you know, look hard enough, right? Well, and it's that overstatement of harm again, where if you have a problem with what I'm saying, then you are like literally placing my life in danger. Yeah, it's insane. You know, really important thing for us to realize is that you know, we are then going to cancel Dorian Abbott's lecture, which has nothing to do. It's not a lecture on equity. It's not like he's he's coming to MIT to stand up and say, stop, stop affirmative action. He's lecturing on something that has nothing to do with that in his field of expertise, which, you know, considering it's a high profile lecture at MIT is probably a a pretty important lecture that people should hear. And he doesn't get, we don't want to hear what he has to say as a professional because we've decided he's a bad person. Let me ask this question. If we found out all of a sudden, um, going back to like March or whatever it was when everybody was about to get the vaccine and they're like, thank God, finally we have a vaccine that will save millions of lives. And we found out that like the person like the, like somebody, some key member who developed this vaccine turned out to be like they had they had they dressed uh they they dressed in in blackface for Halloween fifteen years ago and so all of a sudden let's let's all gather in the streets and smash the vaccines and not and not nobody take a vaccine I I wonder I and I have to say I don't think so I think everybody would still take that fucking vaccine <laughs> should we go back and historically research should we like stop inoculating our children against smallpox if they, do they still do that I don't know that's <laughs> that's the only one we ever eradicated right but it's like all the vaccines that you give children I mean that were developed 100 years ago should we do we go back and I guarantee you some of those people that came up with some of that stuff since it was a long time ago were probably racist and misogynist should we now like refuse to use those vaccines because they they're somehow tied to somebody who ideologically we don't want to be tied to you know I mean where where do you draw the line it gets to a point and of course no one's perfect so there there's always going to be something someone could object to in somebody's past and and no one agrees on what's objectionable so there's no consensus uh, on most things either but you know it's like it reminds me of a, a colleague i had who was writing inspirational quotes on a on one of those erasable whiteboards um that was in a common area in our academic department and, you know, there were like these inspirational quotes and there was one by Nelson Mandela, um, you know, who he fought against apartheid and was the first black president of uh, South Africa after apartheid ended. And and uh, I walk I, I walk in in the in the department and he's erasing that Nelson Mandela quote from the whiteboard. And I said, what's what's wrong or what what are you doing? And he's like, oh, turns out Nelson Mandela did something bad. So and someone there's always going to be someone who can complain about why that person could be offensive to some other person. And then we have to be so sensitive to not offending anyone that you basically can't say anything. And so I just said, you know, you might better just leave the whiteboard blank because you'll never be able to come up with something that. Um, you know, that is important and different and inspiring that someone out there isn't going to say for in its own way is offensive. So I mean, just leave it blank. Uh, if that's uh, and then what? So how are we making any progress? We can't even say anything. We've come to a point now where. Where we're tying 
you know, a person's moral approval rating into like whether they get to speak or not, you know, and, and a person's a person's work is tied directly into that. So if you are not, you know, if you haven't been morally approved as a human being, then you don't get to like you don't get to contribute anything. We don't want to hear from you. So we're getting to the point where we're canceling, you know, we're canceling writers and musicians and painters and filmmakers and and scientists and scholars. We're canceling everybody based on the kind of people they are, based on some infraction that is highly subjective in the first place, the thing that offends this group of people, even though 90% of the people in the country don't give a shit. 10% were offended, and it happens to be bad news for you. It happens to be the 10% that matters. If we keep canceling all kinds of people who we actually need to be a part of society because we don't like them, you know, first of like first of all, like you said, it's highly subjective anyway of who's getting canceled. But also it's just a dangerous thing. We're getting to the point where we are like shutting down vital sectors of a functioning society because we just don't like the people that are behind the closed doors, you know. The behind, and, and meanwhile, a lot of the world isn't being this ridiculous and neurotic, and I am really not sure what the hell is gonna happen to us at this point. It seems it just a, one of the many things that does not bode well for uh, this country and the West in general is that we're just – what do we think? I mean do we think that we can – that we're just going to – do we think that we're like five-year-olds or that we're just in a chronic ongoing therapy session or that we're just children and our parents are going to swoop in at some point and help us out here? I mean I think the key is if you can pl- cancel someone because of their political or uh, views, then – then all that does is tell, and if it's happening in academia, and then all that does is tell people that academia is not a truth-seeking environment, it's a political environment. And that tells everyone that the higher ed as, an, as a social institution can't be trusted. And then that, and that's one of the key institutions that is sort of undergirds a democracy. So then you look at, you know, do we trust the judiciary? Do we trust our, our polling places? Do we trust I mean, the, you know, do you, do you trust that McDonald's isn't going to give you food poison, poisoning when you get your egg McMuffin at the drive through There's all these I sure don't. abstract ins- <laughs> it's all these abstract institutions that do require that even though we don't know all the inner workings, we we trust that their inner workings are generally solid. It yeah. should be, yeah, but that's really, uh, I mean, a great encapsulation of uh, that you just gave there, and it really does, just really quickly, I, I think for me, you know, that's been a, a topic very much in my mind, and for me, the breaking point came, you know, during the pandemic. I think the pandemic, people have talked about this before, is one thing that really robbed us of, of our trust, because I think all along, we've always kind of felt like, even though we sit there and we go, God, America sucks, God, this fucking country, but, you know, actually down deep, all the people who just love to, you know, uh, you know, even the flag burners, you know, they're still kind of glad they live in America down deep, you know, because they know that like when the shit hits the fan, we have this trust that, you know, like, well, you know, this is America. Like they – nothing that bad could happen. Like the, the, they wouldn't let – they wouldn't let anything too crazy happen, you know. And the thing is all of a sudden like the pandemic hits and everybody just expected like, well, they'll, they'll, they'll do what they need to do. It, You know, this couldn't happen here and then it did. Finally, it did. And then you also get – Trump at the same time doing things where we're all going like, well, he can't, he can't do that. He can't get away with that. And actually, yes, he can. Oh, he said that. Oh, surely we got that on tape. That'll be it for him. Nope. People don't even seem to notice. And you just keep losing faith. And then for me, when the Black Lives Matter thing hit and I, my first reaction was like, you know, because this is in the middle of the pandemic where people like religious people are just being like, you know, just mercilessly uh, uh, um, cr- mocked and just threatened, you know, in the media, everybody going like, God, these fucking Christian people in the middle of a pandemic getting together to have a religious service, you know, dis- this should be disallowed. These people should be put in jail. And then the Black Lives Matter thing hits people were out in the streets, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, literally violating a legal curfew to do this. And and then somebody, you know, and then the institution, right? It like, was it the lady in the CDC? Who was it? But like a top level scientists are saying like, this is okay because racism is just as dangerous as COVID and we're going to give them a pass. 
And that's when I said, that's it for me. I'm out. I'm, I'm going to expatriate. Like, I fucking had it with this country. Because for me, as a germaphobe living my worst nightmare in the middle of a pandemic and watching as, as just everyone is scared to death to go outside, there's literally a curfew. Uh, you know, people are, there were, like I said, there were those things where religious people had, had, had gatherings and just were so just crucified, you know, in the press. And then, and then a bunch of people go out there and decide to have a, a protest and and I'm not mocking the seriousness of it, but I'm saying you have to take it in the context of it being in the pandemic and the fact that the institution at the institutional level, they said, that's OK. It's OK to put everybody's lives in danger because your platform is more important than everyone else's lives. 